En primer orden, quisiera hacer un reconocimiento al ministro Antonio Benjamin y a las organizaciones que hicieron posible ese histórico evento. El foro se llama Las promesas de la COP24, 26 climático de Glasgow y Estocolmo más 50. Vamos a iniciar con una breve reseña de la COP26, la vigésima sexta conferencia del clima, que es la mayor y la más importante conferencia relacionada con el clima del planeta. En un mundo sacudido por la pandemia y cuando estamos a punto de agotar el tiempo para evitar la catástrofe climática, la trascendental conferencia de las Naciones Unidas sobre el clima, COP26 de Glasgow, renueva las esperanzas. El cambio climático ha pasado de ser un incómodo problema para muchas personas a una emergencia mundial que amenaza la vida del planeta en las próximas tres décadas. El secretario general de las Naciones Unidas, Antonio Guterres, señaló, si no se actúa con determinación, nos estamos jugando nuestra última oportunidad, literalmente, de cambiar el rumbo de las cosas. Básicamente, París fijó la meta limitar el calentamiento por debajo de los 2 grados centígrados, idealmente 1.5 grados centímetros, pero Glasgow es la última oportunidad de hacerlo realidad. Aunque los países han asumido nuevos compromisos y reafirmado previos, antes de la COP26 el mundo se precipita hacia un peligroso aumento de la temperatura global de al menos 2.7 grados centígrados en este siglo, incluso aunque se cumplieran los objetivos de París. Para Guterres y para los cientos de científicos del Grupo Intergubernamental de Expertos sobre el Cambio Climático, un escenario de calentamiento de 1.5 grados centígrados es el único futuro habitable para la humanidad. El tiempo corre y para poder limitar el calentamiento, el mundo necesita reducir a la mitad las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero en los próximos ocho años. Durante la conferencia se trataron cuatro cuestiones preliminares. En primer orden, asegurar las cero emisiones en todo el mundo para mediados del siglo y mantener los 1.5 grados centígrados. En segundo lugar, adaptarse más para proteger a las comunidades y los hábitats naturales. Movilizar la financiación climática y trabajar juntos para conseguirlo. Eso significa establecer colaboraciones entre los gobiernos, las empresas y la sociedad civil. ¿Qué sigue? Nairobi 2022, Estocolmo, Nueva York. Vamos a iniciar con nuestro orador principal, Lord Robert Cowat, ex juez del Tribunal Supremo del Reino Unido. Lord Robert es un ex juez del Tribunal Supremo Británico, ha sido abogado en ejercicio durante 50 años, 24 como abogado y 26 como juez en todos los niveles, hasta la Corte Suprema, donde se desempeñó desde 2012 hasta el 2020. Durante ese tiempo, también se ha desempeñado como fiscal general de Su Alteza Real, el Príncipe de Gales, presidente de la Comisión Jurídica de Inglaterra y Gales y presidente senior de tribunales. Pasamos de seguido a escucharle. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm not sure who I'm addressing, but I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm very sorry not to be with you in Rio, but um, it's a privilege to be allowed to take part in this distant form. Um, I also don't really know to what extent you had a chance to talk about COP26. But what I was proposing to do in the um, quarter of an hour or so that I have is to um, just give a personal view of what it was like to be at Glasgow for the COP26 and where I think things are going. Um, the, uh, I think as was said by our chair, chair the, it, it, it was a remarkable event. The fact that it happened at all was in doubt until fairly um, shortly before the, um, I mean, in the middle of a pandemic, the idea of getting together representatives of some 190 countries in Glasgow 
with all the thousands of people who had a legitimate interest in being there, either for businesses or as objectors or interested parties or protesters. That was a major, major problem. Um, it wasn't helped by the terrible weather conditions which greeted the beginning of the um, of the events, not untypical, sadly, for Scotland, but it did mean that the um, num number of trains were out of service, when, which were supposed to be taking people to Glasgow, and it also meant that we had the rather unfortunate sight of people queuing in the rain to try and get in to the pavilions. But um, I think once it settled down, the, um, on the whole, it went remarkably well. Um, there were obvious complaints about accessibility and finding out what was going on, but um, it passed without, as far as I know, any major COVID outbreak. It passed without any major public disorder. And given the enormous numbers of people who had legitimate protests to make, that was quite an achievement. I think it was very well and sensitively policed. So I think it was a triumph of organization. It was an enormously important event, as has been said, because it was really um, a major opportunity to take forward the Paris goals, and but recognizing the limitations of what had been agreed by uh, in Paris and the need to improve performance enormously. It was also, of course, the first opportunity um, for some years for the Americans to play a major part in the process um, following the Trump years, which were sadly uh, very unproductive. Um, and I think there's no doubt that John Kerry, as the ambassador for the American president played a, a very active and visible part in what was going on. Um, I was there really in a, a sort of um, incidental capacity, um, mainly in my role as a visiting professor of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the LSE, which you probably know is one of the leading um, institutions in the world, probably for research on climate change issues, and um, has maintained a very good database of information about both litigation and legislation in this field. And they've been kind enough to uh, accept me as a colleague since I retired from the Supreme Court. Um, we um, took part in um, two major side events on climate change and the law, um, one organized by Grantham with Strathclyde University, which is one of the main local universities, the other organized by <clears throat> the Cambridge Law and Governance Institute uh, with, in conjunction with Glasgow University. And Antonio Benjamin was happily there and took part in both, and he may have told you something about them. Um, I think the, uh, the Strathclyde event in particular was uh, very well structured and attracted a lot of interest. And we looked in some detail both at the, at the legislation um, relating to climate change around the world and also at the past developing case law. Um, we also held uh, an event in what's called the Blue Zone, which is the main uh, zone where all the negotiations go on. Um, that was at the invitation of the so-called climate champions, which um, are a sort of body, well, they're in fact two individuals whose so job it is to, to rally support among in business and industry for the work on climate change. And um, as some of you may have seen, we put together um, a, a group of videos from judges who are mainly members of the Global Judges Institute uh, on the contribution of the courts to issues of climate change around the world. Um, and I think they were very, very effective, actually. And then we had had an event which where we had a sort of compilation of the 
extract from those videos. And we had a discussion about them, which I took part uh, with Christina Voigt, who chaired it. Sadly, Antonio was not able to be there, but we had the benefit of um, a younger Brazilian judge, Justice Rafaela Rosa, who talked about the way in which the younger judiciary are contributing to the development of the case law and litigation on climate change. So I think that went, went well. It's available to see online. And um, I hope that we can sort of build on that basis. It certainly was a good, good event from the point of view of the Global Judges Institute. Um, the, a, a, a major disappointment for me was that I wasn't able to interest the COP26 team within the UK government in having a law and order stream in the climate change program. It seemed to me that the UK has a very good record. Our Climate Change Act of 2008 was one of the first and the world leader in terms of specialized legislation. And on the whole, the government has had a pretty good record in putting it into effect so far. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, as you all know, and uh, we have now programs, detailed programs taking us up to 2038 for what are what is required, um, but uh, and the extent to which they are actually going to be implementing practice is something which we'll be looking at closely. But I was sorry that we didn't uh, persuade them to make that part of sort of center, center issue, because I think it's such an important part of what um, uh, of the whole process. I mean, the Paris Agreement is, a, of course, enormously important agreement at international level, but it depends on um, national contributions being worked out at national level and being given effect through national legislation and the national courts. And I think the interaction of those is, is, is enormously important. I hope that perhaps at a future COP, we might be able to give that whole issue a more prominent role, and perhaps the um, uh, this institute and the judges institute will be able to assist in that. Um, now, as to what came out of um, the COP, um, uh, as everyone um, knows, it, it left an awful lot of work to be done. Um, the objective of getting down to uh, it, it, in increases of 1.5 degrees um, is still a long way off and um, much work needs to be done. But I think the, um, the general feeling was that, that the, um, uh, the COP was a major step forward. Um, certainly, the, I think the, the British delegation um, did a, a, an enormous amount of work, and I think the particular the minister, Alex Sharma, received a great deal of credit and respect for what he did, um, which I have to say, given some of the members of our present government, is quite a, um, quite a relief. Not all our members of government seem to be quite as serious as he certainly was, and I think he was regarded by everyone as a genuinely independent and objective player who was much respected. Uh, and of course, that was assisted by people like John Kerry, who took an active interest throughout, and a number of other people. Um, I uh, uh, the so there's a lot of detailed uh, issues which were, I think, filled out in the Paris Agreement. The so-called Paris Rule Book um, was evidently completed. Now, I think Christina Voigt may or others may be better able to tell you about the detail of that than I am, but it's clearly that the sort of mechanisms of the Paris Agreement are going to be very important as we go forward in um, ensuring transparency in the way it is implemented, and that a lot of progress was made in that direction. Um, we also had the so-called Glasgow Climate Pact, which was the um, agreement which came out of the um, uh, the COP, and um, in the end, it was agreed, and that in itself is quite an achievement when you've got quite so many people with different interests involved. I think it's um, 
it's particularly important that it, it although it, it, it talks in language of reaffirmation and recognizing and so on, rather than mandatory language, it, it is very important that the um, it, it reinforces the messages of the Paris Agreement. And there's a chapter on mitigation, chapter four, which clearly reaffirms the importance of the limiting temperature increases to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change, um, and recognizes that achieving that requires both rapid, deep, and sustained reductions in global greenhouse gas emissions, including reducing global carbon dioxide emissions by 45 percent 45% by 2030 relative to the 2010 level and to net zero around mid-century, as well as deep reductions in other greenhouse gases. So that's, again, really just reinforcing what's already there, but it does put it in fairly stark detail. Um, and it then has this sort of slightly controversial passage included reference to coal that says, Paragraph 20 calls upon parties to accelerate the development, deployment, and dissemination of technologies and the adoption of policies to transition towards low emission energy systems, including by rapidly scaling up the deployment of clean power generation and energy efficiency measures, including accelerating efforts towards the phase down of unabated coal power and phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies are providing targeted support to the poorest and most vulnerable in line with national circumstances and recognizing the need for support towards a just transition. Now, some may say, well, that is pretty woolly. And there was a great discussion about uh, the change from phase out of unabated coal power to phase down of unabated coal power. But I think the general view is to have having a specific reference to um, the fact that coal is a historic means of um, energy and a very clear emphasis on the transition to uh, low emission energy system. And having that signed up to by everyone, including the Chinese and the Indians, was an important step forward. And we'll obviously see where, where that takes us. Um, there was a, a lot of other points made in the uh, in, in the, the pact. I mean, also disappointing was the failure to afford to finance the 100 billion promise it was actually clearly met. But again, steps being made in that direction. Um, I think um, I, I, I can't do really better, I think, by way of conclusion than re referring to a summary by uh, Professor uh, Lord Nicholas Stern, who is, as you may know, the chair of the Grantham Research Institute, indeed was its founder, but has been one of the most influential economists in this field and has been very much involved in advising not only the UK, but also uh, has close links with China and India and others. Um, now, you can, if you go to the Grantham website, you'll see a lot of very useful material about the um, uh, review of the COP26 and what come before and afterwards. But um, I'll just read what he said. The preparation of this COP session and the summit itself have brought very important advances that are not formally part of the negotiations. They have focused the world's attention on the importance and urgency of limiting warming to 1.5 Celsius degrees and achieving net zero emissions by the middle of the century. They have also drawn attention to the great opportunities arising from different form of development, stronger, cleaner, more efficient, more resilient, and more inclusive. And the United States and China, the two biggest emitters, have also pledged to work together on climate, not just the deep and serious difference between them on other issues. 
And he refers to the other major initiatives on deforestation and on controlling methane um, and the commitment by some key countries, including India, South Africa, and Vietnam, to new forms of development um, and the need to manage um, the dislocations arising from the zero carbon transition in a just way, while also seizing the opportunities offered by the industry of the future. Uh, he also says the Glasgow Pact itself is a major step forward which charts a future for increasing finance from developed to developing countries, doubling of adaptation finance and on finance in general for adaptation, mitigation and sustainable development. And he says it the pact includes, crucially for the first time, in decision form uh, from COP, the importance of phasing down of unabated coal power and phasing out inefficient subsidies for fossil fuels. <coughs> As he says, the last minute watering down of this fate is unfortunate, but is unlikely to slow down a strong momentum past coal, a dirty fuel of an earlier area. Uh, and he concludes in this way, overall, COP26 has been a major step along the way, but has still left us far short of the target of limiting warming to 1.5 Celsius degrees. That is why it is so important that countries agree to put forward by the end of next year more ambition, ambitious pledges for emissions cuts by 2030. COP26 in Glasgow embodied a shared understanding of just how dangerous our current path is, and indeed the dangers of warming beyond 1.5 degrees. It is this understanding together with a recognition of the tremendous opportunities now on offer from, for doing things differently and creating a new sustainable, inclusive and resilient economic path. So that's quite a positive, upbeat assessment from someone who's a veteran of many of these COPs and is very much central in advising countries like um, India and China on the way forward. So I uh, come out of this cautiously optimistic. I remain very keen to um, put the issue of the law more firmly at the center of the argument. And I shall certainly now be working with the Grantham Institute and others to try and develop that debate. But for the meantime, I look forward to working with you all over the coming years to carry forward these objectives. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. This is uh, Rang Milnur, uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice in uh, Norway. Uh, couldn't be in Rio, me either, but I am very thankful that technology makes it possible for me to attend anyhow. I can see myself now in two screens, but... Uh, <laughs> I hope it's okay. So uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to you, Robert. Uh, in fact, I have to say that uh, I have always, uh, you, you have been an inspiration as to how it is possible to work as a justice in the Supreme Court and still engage actively and very deeply in environmental law, controversial questions, and still keep your integrity as a judge the way you have done. I think maybe it's the combination of deep knowledge and the British humor uh, that you <laughs> are an exponent of. And, and thank you also for giving us this little look behind the scenes. It's not so easy to assess whether the COP20 uh, was a success or not. And, and maybe I think only in the future, we will know for sure whether it was enough. Now we will go to the next speaker, David Boyd. <clears throat> and he is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. And that he has been since 2018. Apart from that, he is Associate Professor of Law Policy and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia and he has had numerous other roles and tasks concerning environmental law. Uh, I can mention that he has served as executive director of Ecojustice. He has appeared before the Supreme Court of Canada. 
and he has been a special advisor on sustainability for the Can Canadian Prime Minister. And I also know, uh, David, that you are especially pleased with uh, Human uh, Rights Committee resolution, which was adopted earlier this autumn. And I suppose you will talk about that. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Justice Nor. It's nice to see you again. And uh, thank you, Lord Carnwath, for those comments about COP26. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the first thing that's absolutely critical to emphasize is that we are living in an unprecedented climate emergency. Here in Canada, where I live, the temperatures reached 49 degrees Celsius this summer, an almost unbelievable heat wave that we, that we endured. It killed 600 people here in British Columbia and also catalyzed massive forest fires, which burned close to a million hectares of our, of our beautiful old growth forests, which brings us a connection with the global biodiversity crisis as well. And just recently, uh, just this week, in fact, I returned from a country mission to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, a breathtakingly beautiful uh, island state in the Caribbean. And the impact of the climate crisis upon the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines was truly heartbreaking to observe. They are suffering from increased frequency and intensity of hurricanes. They're also, they have had... Uh, also extreme rain events that have caused mudslides and landslides and caused loss of life. They're also at the same time experiencing drought, which is adversely impacting their ability to fulfill their, their people's right to food. And so over the course of the past decade, St. Vincent and the Grenadines has spent literally hundreds of millions of dollars, this tiny state, to repair, rebuild, and uh, build back infrastructure that has been damaged by these climate-related natural disasters. So I think it's important to, to bring those experiences of people in the small island developing states when we talk about COP26 and whether we can evaluate COP26 as a success. Just to, just to emphasize, it was COP26. Countries have made commitments to address climate change dating back to 1992. And one of the fundamental problems with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, with the Paris Agreement, and with the, the, Gla the Glasgow Climate Pact, as Lord Carnwath mentioned, the, the pact is not mandatory. These international environmental laws do not have any compliance or enforcement mechanisms that enable us to uh, ensure accountability. And that's where there's such an absolutely critical role for human rights to have an interface between human rights and international environmental law. And we're beginning to see this in very creative ways. And so I wanna talk about that for the majority of my time with you today, because courts of course, have a vital role to play in defending human rights, whether those human rights are constitutionally recognized, whether they're in legislation or whether they're in uh, international treaties. We've come a long way since Stockholm the Stockholm Declaration of 1972, where there was a very ambiguous articulation of the right to live in a healthy environment. But that Stockholm Declaration was a catalyst for the inclusion of the right to a healthy environment in constitutions, legislation, and regional human rights treaties. And we're now in a position where more than 155 nations legally recognize the right to a healthy environment, either in their constitutions, their legislation, or through the ratification of human rights treaties. That's over 80% of the member nations of the, United, of the United Nations. And as Justice Noor alluded to, in October of this year, for the first time, the United Nations Human Rights Council passed a resolution recognizing that everyone has the fundamental human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. This resolution was adopted uh, with 43 states in favor, in favor, none against, and four states abstaining. Those were India, Russia, China, and Japan. Um, so again, this is a non-binding, not legally enforceable resolution from the Human Rights Council. So what, what difference can we expect it to make? And I think that we can learn from by looking at the past. The last time there was a resolution of this nature was in 2010, when for the first time the United ne Nations recognized the fund of a human, fundamental human rights to water and sanitation. Again, not a legally binding or enforceable uh, resolution. However, a catalyst for change at the national level. So countries like Costa Rica, Fiji, Mexico, Slovenia, Tunisia, all changed their constitutions, their highest and strongest laws to incorporate the right to water. 
Other countries, including France and Colombia, changed legislation to make the right to water have legal protection in their countries. And the most important thing that flows from these legal changes, and, and this is a point I can't emphasize strongly enough, changes on the ground in terms of impacts on people's lives. So Mexico, as I mentioned, which changed their constitution in 2012 to recognize the right to water, flowing from this UN resolution in 2010. Mexico has put in place a program that has delivered safe drinking water to more than 1,000 rural communities that previously did not have access to clean drinking water. That is transformative for people's lives. In, in Slovenia, after the constitutional recognition of the right to water, the government made tremendous efforts to bring safe drinking water to Roma communities living on the outskirts uh, of Slovenian cities in informal settlements. Again, changing the lives of the people living in those communities. And here in Canada, where I live, Canada actually opposed recognition of the right to water. We abstained during the vote at the General Assembly in 2010. But after that vote was passed by an overwhelming margin, our government changed its position, acknowledged the right to water, and in the past seven years has worked with Indigenous communities to bring clean drinking water to more than 120 Indigenous communities that in some cases for decades had not had access to safe drinking water. So this experience with the resolution on the right to water and sanitation from 2010 indicates that this year's resolution, the resolution recognizing the right to a healthy environment, will be a catalyst for some of these same types of changes. So what's next? Well, the next thing that we are hoping to do with the support of countries like Costa Rica, the Maldives, Germany, and others, is to move forward with a similar resolution at the General Assembly ideally as early as the, the spring of 2022. There's been a unanimous recommendation in, it's, it's kind of interesting, Europe, which is acknowledged for its leadership in the fields of environmental protection and human rights, the European Convention on Human Rights is the only regional human rights treaty regime in the world that does not explicitly acknowledge the right to a healthy environment. All of the others do, whether it's Africa, Latin America, the Arab Charter, the uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations Human Rights Declaration. These all recognize the right to a healthy environment. So here, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in September of this year passed a unanimous resolution calling for an additional protocol to the European Convention that would recognize the right to a healthy environment. So that's a, that's a really important develop in the European context. At the global level, there is a draft treaty on transnational businesses and human rights, which uh, the draft of that treaty includes a reference to the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Negotiations are ongoing about the post-20 global biodiversity framework. And again, it will be critical to include the right to a healthy environment there. The state of New York in the United States in uh, November had a referendum on adding the right to a healthy environment to the state constitution. And that referendum was successful with an overwhelming majority of people voting in favor of adding the right to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment to the state constitution in New York. Interestingly, we're also starting to see the right to a healthy environment resolution from the United Nations Human Rights Council enter into the uh, court decisions around the world. So the first court in the world to refer to uh, UN Human Rights Council Resolution 48-13 was the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court of Costa Rica in a November decision about the registration of a pesticide where the scientific evidence is quite clear that this pesticide is having an adverse impact on bee populations. And bees, of course, are critical as pollinators in uh, enabling us to fulfill the right to food. So based on the right to a healthy environment in Article 50 of Costa Rica's constitution, the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court of Costa Rica made a very strong decision uh, indicating that the government should no longer uh, authorize the use of this bee killing pesticide. Uh, just last week, the Constitutional Court of Ecuador in a case regarding mining, a proposed mining development in a protected forest um, referred to resolution 48 slash 13 in, uh, in the context of a decision about whether mining in a protected forest is consistent with the right to a healthy environment. And in that case, they found that the mining activities 
were not consistent with the right to a healthy environment and uh, overturned the government's approval of that. So I think that over the course of the next eight years, we're going to see an increasing number of cases coming to courts based on this fundamental right to a healthy environment. Because at the end of the day, this is how citizens can achieve an attempt to achieve accountability. When governments are not complying with their international obligations pursuant to the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, or other international environmental agreements, if we bring human rights into the picture and we acknowledge the clear and compelling scientific evidence that ecological degradation, that climate change are having a tremendous adverse impact on human rights, then we actually can have a vital role for the judiciary in protecting human rights from these different types of uh, environmental degradation. And so in my work as the UN Special Rapporteur, what I've done over the past three years is produce a series of reports uh, articulating the, the substantive content of the right to a healthy and sustainable environment. So I've done reports on clean air, setting forth the actions that governments must take to fulfill their obligations with respect to air quality, which is a, a I mean, we talk about the climate crisis, air pollution is killing 7 million people every year on this planet. 7 million people, including more than 600,000 children under the age of five. This is a critical human rights crisis, and courts have a key role to play in ensuring that governments take more ambitious action to protect the right to a healthy environment from the scourge of air pollution. So for example, uh, just two months ago, a court in Indonesia found that the government's failure to improve air quality in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, violated the constitutional right to a healthy environment and ordered the government to take a number of concrete steps, including air quality monitoring, stronger air quality standards, and uh, other actions to ensure that citizens have their right to breathe clean air be fulfilled in Indonesia. Um, other substantive aspects of the right to a healthy environment include safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainably produced food, a safe climate, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, and non-toxic environments where people can live, work, study, and play. So for each of these substantive elements, I've prepared reports to the United Nations, and I'm delighted to see that courts are now beginning to use these reports as evidence of the substantive content of the right to a healthy environment. Courts also have a critical role to play in articulating the principles that should be used to guide government decision-making in this context, principles such as the precautionary principle, prevention, non-discrimination, and um, the polluter pays principle. And so uh, I don't want to take up any more of people's time just to conclude by saying that we face these interconnected global environmental crises, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the air pollution crisis, the emergence of uh, infectious diseases that are spilling over from wildlife into livestock and humans. All of these things are interconnected and we need to use human rights based approaches to equitably and effectively tackle these pressing challenges. So I look forward to working with all of you and I thank you very much to all of you who are participating in this important conference so that we can learn from each other and move forward expeditiously to protect the human rights, particularly of the most vulnerable people from these environmental threats. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, you kind of started on a critical note, uh, saying that all these international uh, uh, resolutions, they are not binding, uh, they have no enforcement mechanisms. But then you changed course a little bit and pointed out that there are also many positive developments, that 80% of the world now have the right to clean uh, and healthy environment in their constitutions, and that these resolutions and other work that it's done on environmental law is a catalyst for changing happening in all parts of society and in courts, and in the European Human, human Rights uh, Court also. So it was, very interesting. And I mean, your enthusiasm, your overview of what is happening around the world 
it's inspiring. Thank you very much. The next speaker uh, is Jan Aguila. He is a professor of public law and environmental law at Science Po in uh, Paris. And he is uh, at the same time a lawyer and partner of the law firm Bredin Pratt. And before joining the bar, he was a judge at the French Administrative Supreme Court, the Conseil d'Etat. My French is not perfect, but uh, you understand perfect. what I mean. But the reason why uh, Jan Aguila is uh, going to speak here is that he uh, is deeply involved in environmental law work. He chairs the Environmental Commission of the think tank, Le Club de Juristes. And he has been, not least, working tirelessly with the Global Pact for the Environmental for the Environment Initiative. And I'm looking forward to hear what you have, your thoughts on that, Jan. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je vais parler aujourd'hui en français. Bonjour, tardi, buenas tardes, good evening. I, I'm going to speak French. Je vais parler français. C'est une langue dans laquelle je me sens plus à l'aise. Je remercie beaucoup les, les organisateurs de, de cette conférence et je suis très heureux d'intervenir aujourd'hui avec euh, tous, ces, tous ces amis. Euh, je, je voudrais commencer par euh, rebondir sur ce que David Boyd a dit. Effectivement, nous traversons une crise planétaire sans précédent. Et je crois vraiment qu'il faut avoir ça présent à l'esprit quand on est en train de réfléchir sur les actions possibles. Et je voudrais juste citer deux anecdotes. D'abord, à la fin de la COP26, vous vous souvenez qu'effectivement, le ministre anglais Alok Sharma s'est excusé. Il avait les larmes aux yeux et il s'est excusé euh, des difficultés qui avaient été rencontrées. Et ça donne le sentiment que les États sont conscients que leur action n'est pas toujours à la hauteur des attentes des citoyens. Deuxième anecdote, une professeure l'autre jour me racontait qu'elle avait fait un cours auprès de ses étudiants en décrivant les conclusions du dernier rapport du GIEC, IPCC. Euh, et à la fin, deux étudiants pleuraient. Ils pleuraient. Ils avaient des larmes aux yeux. Parce que, il y a peut-être une différence de génération, mais pour un jeune, quand on lui décrit l'avenir qu'il attend, c'est sa vie qui est devant lui. Quand on lui parle de 2030, de 2050, pour lui, c'est toute la vie qu'il attend. Et ce qui est terrible, c'est de voir une sorte d'impuissance euh, du pouvoir politique face à, à ces événements, face à cette crise planétaire. Je voulais juste commencer euh, par souligner à la fois la gravité de la crise, comme l'a dit David, euh, et aussi de l'autre côté une sorte d'impuissance des autorités politiques. Alors, il n'y a pas de solution miracle, nous sommes tous d'accord, mais on voit bien que le chemin est très difficile. Pour donner un exemple en ce qui concerne le climat, et dans un deuxième temps je vais venir sur le sujet des, euh, du pacte mondial pour l'environnement, mais d'abord, juste un exemple sur le climat, je, je voulais mentionner euh, la décision que vient de rendre le Conseil d'État français, qui est la Cour administrative suprême en France, et qui vient donc de rendre une décision le 1er juillet 2021, vous en avez peut-être entendu parler, qui est une décision dans laquelle le juge condamne l'État à renforcer le niveau de ses ambitions à renforcer les mesures en matière climatique. Et euh, pour arriver à cette conclusion, le Conseil d'État a observé que, actuellement, les mesures prises par le gouvernement étaient insuffisantes. Et 
c'est cette insuffisance des politiques climatiques que je voulais souligner. En particulier avec une image, une image qui a été prise par euh, un des membres du Conseil d'État. Il disait, euh, c'est un peu comme un coureur de marathon. Un coureur de marathon. Euh, par parenthèse, je parle lentement pour être sûr que les traducteurs euh, euh, vous traduisent bien au fur et à mesure. Et, et donc, euh, si on prend l'exemple de la France, qui a été jugée par le Conseil d'État, et je pense que c'est transposable à beaucoup d'autres pays, la France a pris un engagement dans lequel elle a dit « Entre 1990 et 2030, 1990-2030, une période de 40 ans, je m'engage à réduire, à diminuer les émissions de gaz à effet de serre de 40%. Mais le Conseil d'État observe qu'au jour où il statue, en 2021, la France n'a fait que 20% de diminution. En 30 ans, elle a fait 20%. Et donc, le gouvernement dit, je vais en 10 ans, même pas d'ailleurs, en 9 ans, 9 années, je vais réduire à nouveau de 20% pour atteindre les 40%. Et l'image qui est prise, c'est celle du coureur de marathon. Un des membres du Conseil d'État disait, c'est comme si, imaginez un coureur de marathon qui vient de faire la moitié de la course et là, on lui dit, c'est bien, tu as bien couru, mais maintenant, tu vas courir trois fois plus vite pour arriver au bout. Comment est-ce possible C'est simplement pour donner une idée de l'ampleur de la tâche qui nous attend. C'est aussi pour dîner, donner une idée de euh, la difficulté pour les pouvoirs publics à être crédibles. Comment être crédible Comment est-ce que les citoyens peuvent croire que nous allons faire en 8 ans ou 9 ans ce que nous avons mis 30 ans à faire Comment est-ce que d'ici 2030, c'est-à-dire demain, on va être capable de diminuer autant les émissions de gaz à effet de serre On voit que le, le, le chemin est, est très, très compliqué. Comment y arriver Comment y arriver c'est très difficile et encore une fois, il n'y a pas de solution miracle. Mais dans toute la gamme des outils que nous avons, les outils sont nombreux, il y a des outils économiques, euh, il y a euh, l'éducation et il y a le droit. Et dans toute cette gamme des outils, je crois au droit, je crois au pouvoir des obligations juridiques et je crois en particulier au pouvoir euh, comme David l'a dit, euh, d'une approche par les droits humains. Parce que il y a une sorte euh, de levier d'action grâce à ces droits humains. Parce que si on donne des droits aux citoyens, les citoyens peuvent aller saisir le juge et le juge peut contraindre les États à agir et le juge peut contraindre les entreprises à agir et le juge peut contraindre les citoyens à agir. Je crois beaucoup pour ma part au pouvoir du droit. Et c'est pour ça que, pour en venir maintenant au projet de pacte mondial pour l'environnement, euh, je, je crois beaucoup en euh, la nécessité d'un texte international qui consacre avec une valeur juridique obligatoire, il faut que ce soit obligatoire, des droits et des devoirs en matière d'environnement. C'était le projet donc de, du Pacte mondial pour l'environnement. Je vais décrire en, en quelques, quelques mots euh, le voyage du Pacte mondial pour l'environnement. C'est comme un voyage. Tout a commencé à New York et peut-être tout va finir à New York. D'abord, en 2018, à New York, l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies a voté une résolution qui s'appelle « Vers un pacte mondial pour l'environnement 
C'est une résolution qui ouvre des négociations sur un pacte mondial. L'idée du pacte, c'était donc de consacrer dans un texte juridique un traité à valeur obligatoire, les droits, les devoirs en matière d'environnement et en particulier, bien sûr, le droit à l'environnement sain. L'utilité de ce pacte, ça serait d'avoir une base juridique pour les citoyens, pour pouvoir invoquer ces droits vis-à-vis -vis des gouvernants. Je n'ai pas le temps de développer, mais comme je l'ai dit, nous avons besoin de ce type de, de texte. Euh, en, en quelques mots, quel a été le voyage de ce projet de pacte, euh, de l'esprit de ce projet de pacte. D'abord, nous sommes allés à Nairobi, au siège du programme des Nations Unies pour l'environnement. Il y a eu un premier round de négociations qui, malheureusement, a été difficile. Euh, et un certain nombre d'États, pas nombreux, mais puissants, se sont opposés au projet de pacte. Les États-Unis, de Donald Trump à l'époque, et la Russie en particulier. Et dans un esprit de consensus, les États ont décidé finalement de se replier sur euh, un texte moins ambitieux qui serait une simple déclaration. L'année suivante, effectivement, en août 2019, à nouveau à New York, l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies a voté une deuxième résolution qui euh, est la suite de, de cette négociation, c'est la résolution 73-333 qui mandate l'Assemblée des Nations unies euh, pour adopter une déclaration, une simple déclaration. Donc, sans valeur juridique obligatoire. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes dans cette phase de négociation de la déclaration, qui est donc un peu l'étape suivante après le pacte, une simple déclaration. Cette déclaration doit être adoptée lors de l'Assemblée des Nations Unies pour l'environnement, qui se tiendra en mars 2022 à Nairobi. Donc, retour à Nairobi. On a euh, vu passer des projets de texte qui circulent en ce moment. Il y a des négociations entre les États. Un dernier round de négociations entre les États vient d'avoir lieu en novembre. Et pour ma part, je ne suis pas très optimiste. Je ne suis pas très optimiste parce que les projets qu'on voit circuler euh, parlent assez peu de droits environnementaux. Ils, ils sont... Euh, ces projets... Euh, sont très classiques, on, on voit surtout euh, les habituels euh, appels à renforcer le rôle euh, du programme des Nations Unies pour l'environnement, à donner plus de moyens aux États pour euh, mieux appliquer le droit de l'environnement, euh, mais on a très peu de choses sur les droits en matière d'environnement. Il y a deux choses, il y a dans le préambule du projet actuel, dans le préambule, il y a euh, le droit à l'environnement sain, mais uniquement dans le préambule. Et ensuite, à l'intérieur du texte, il y a les droits procéduraux, les classiques droits procéduraux, que sont le droit euh, à l'information, le droit à la participation du public et l'accès à la justice. Pour le moment, c'est tout ce que nous avons. Et en plus, la difficulté, c'est que en novembre, lors de la dernière négociation, Certains États, toujours les mêmes, se sont opposés, se sont même opposés à ce qu'on mentionne, ces droits environnementaux, euh, et donc en particulier les États-Unis et la Russie. En revanche, de l'autre côté, un certain nombre d'États étaient très favorables à ça, hein, et en particulier d'ailleurs euh, l'Union européenne, avec une certaine unité retrouvée d'ailleurs, y compris l'Allemagne, la France, euh, la Norvège aussi, était très favorable, le Maroc, euh, beaucoup de pays d'Amérique latine, le Costa Rica, la Colombie, étaient favorables à euh, une déclaration ambitieuse. On verra, ça c'est la prochaine étape, à Nairobi en mars 2022, je ne suis pas très très optimiste quand même. Il y a aussi un autre rendez-vous important en 2022, c'est Stockholm, avec le 50e anniversaire de 
euh, la fameuse conférence de Stockholm de 1972. Malheureusement, je ne suis pas très optimiste non plus parce que à Stockholm, ce sera un sommet de deux jours seulement et je crains qu'il n'y ait pas de grands résultats lors de, lors de ce sommet international. En revanche, et là c'est le retour à New York, en revanche, comme David l'a dit, euh, j'ai bon espoir que l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies adopte une résolution identique à la résolution qui a été adoptée à Genève sur le droit à l'environnement sain. C'est un projet qui est soutenu par plusieurs États et cette résolution-là, il faut bien avoir présent à l'esprit que c'est une résolution pleine de potentiel. Parce que si vous prenez la résolution qui a été adoptée à euh, Genève, euh, ça n'est pas juste un seul article qui dirait euh, « le droit à l'environnement sain est reconnu, point final ». Non, c'est beaucoup plus important que ça. Euh, on a le premier point sur le droit à l'environnement sain, mais on a aussi, deuxième point, euh, une mention des autres droits, les autres droits qui sont liés à l'environnement sain. Alors, la résolution de Genève ne mentionne pas prudemment, avec prudence, les autres droits, mais on imagine tous les autres droits qui pourraient être mentionnés. Droit à un air pur, droit à l'eau, droit à l'information du public, toute une série d'autres droits qui découlent, qui dérivent du droit à l'environnement sain, c'est le deuxième point. Et troisième point dans la résolution, euh, on a une référence aux obligations qui pèsent sur les États pour protéger le droit à l'environnement sain. Parce que quand on dit qu'on a un droit d'un côté, souvent on a de l'autre côté des obligations qui pèsent sur les États pour respecter ce droit. Et à la fin, et je vais conclure avec ça, l'étape suivante, si demain nous avons une résolution de l'Assemblée générale des Nations Unies, l'étape suivante, après demain, ce serait qu'une convention internationale, une forme de pacte mondial qui consacrerait cette fois dans un texte de droit dur, un texte obligatoire, un ensemble de droits, d'abord le droit à l'environnement sain, mais aussi tous les droits qui en découlent et par voie de conséquence aussi les obligations qui pèsent sur les États de protéger ces droits à l'environnement sain. Et ce petit voyage depuis New York jusqu'à Nairobi, en passant par Genève et en revenant à New York, ça nous montre un peu que l'esprit du pacte souffle où il veut, pour reprendre une formule connue. Voilà, je, je vous remercie et j'espère que nous allons pouvoir poursuivre ensemble ce travail pour euh, consacrer les, les, les droits et les valeurs qui nous rassemblent tous dans ces moments euh, difficiles. Nuestro agradecimiento a Ian Águila y demás panelistas por su puntualidad en el tiempo concedido, pero especialmente por lo que nos interesa, que nos den el honor de compartir sus profundos conocimientos, expertise y mirada esperanzadora, o mejor dicho, su cauto optimismo, en lo que coincidieron los tres, sin perjuicio de las valiosísimas ideas que nos puede aportar la honorable jueza copresidenta. Me atrevo a dar algunas ideas generales. Sobre la presentación de Lord Robert, en realidad eh, nos deja muy claro la excelente organización de la COP26 en medio de una pandemia, situación bastante difícil por las medidas sanitarias que debieron tomarse, y su planteamiento del capto optimismo, posición esperanzadora que depende de los aportes nacionales e internacionales, fue un importante paso adelante, esto nos llena de mucho positivismo. Se espera más de la futura conferencia de las partes, pues quedó mucho trabajo pendiente, ya que como sabemos, 1.5 grados aún está muy distante. Referencia al Pacto Climático de Glasgow, producto de la concertación de posiciones de personas y de estados con diversos intereses, eso lo sabemos, que refuerza el Acuerdo de París y fortalece una transición justa a sistemas de bajas emisiones. Lamentablemente, como nos señalan, no se habló del tema de financiamiento, que es de mucho interés de nosotros, los países en vías de desarrollo, para contar con Estados Unidos y China, quienes tienen mayores emisiones. 
David Boyd nos planteó también su posición esperanzadora, que se mantiene en la exposición, quien señaló no es una resolución vinculante, la comisión, pero se espera generen cambios importantes, como lo han hecho otros pronunciamientos anteriores en países como Alemania, México y Costa Rica, con el tema del agua, además de las experiencias que nos relata con poblaciones indígenas y el suministro del agua. Especial referencia a la afectación en las abejas las plaguicidas, según la resolución de la Sala Constitucional de la Corte Suprema de Justicia de Costa Rica, y también la incompatibilidad de la minería con los bosques. Realmente, aunque no sean resoluciones vinculantes, se nota que ha plasmado su vigencia en varios pronunciamientos internos de los países. Finalmente, sobre Ian Águila, la crisis planetaria sin precedentes que nos señala, especialmente sobre el último informe del IPCC y las lágrimas que derramaron jóvenes estudiantes, que también derramamos nosotros, ya no tan jóvenes, sin embargo, sabemos que somos corresponsables de la situación que estamos viviendo corresponsables como jueces si no tomamos decisiones lo antes posible. En la decisión del Consejo del Estado francés, que nos relata, muy importante, donde se condena al Estado a reforzar las medidas con respecto al clima, o las tomadas no son suficientes. Realmente esa es una línea que podemos eh, seguir los, los diferentes países, porque creo que es la situación compartida por los diferentes eh, países de América, Europa y demás continentes. Realmente creo yo que de estas exposiciones tan profundas podemos eh, concluir que hay una gran responsabilidad de parte de nosotros como jueces, magistrados, magistradas, relación con esto no es suficiente con la emisión de resoluciones en los casos concretos, resoluciones que tienen que ir más allá muchas veces de lo que se nos está planteando, sino que nuestras gestiones tienen que ser abiertas, tienen que ser innovadoras, tiene que haber realmente un cambio a partir de este momento, si es que ya no lo hemos estado haciendo, con una visión de urgencia, porque la crisis planetaria que estamos viviendo pues es bastante grave. Vamos a dar inicio a un periodo de preguntas y respuestas, les escuchamos. Um, bonjour, uh, ma question s'adresse à Monsieur Ian Aguilar. Uh, la dernière fois qu'on s'est vu, c'était dans mon jury de thèse, ça fait quelques années. Et uh, je, je me permets de poser la question en portugais pour que la plupart des gens comprennent ici. Uh, a minha pergunta é sobre a décision du Conseil d'État. E, mas eu queria saber mais especificamente se essa decisão, ela define como o Estado deve cumprir essas obrigações ou se ela simplesmente uh, fixa uma obrigação aberta para o Estado e mais uh, se ela prevê algum meio de, de forçar o cumprimento. Pode parecer estranho eu perguntar isso, porque em princípio a decisão se cumpre, né? mas é uma, é, tem relação com aquilo que nós conversávamos ontem no painel, que é a dificuldade de executar uma decisão uh, dessa natureza. Então, eu gostaria de saber do Monsieur Ian Aguilar se ele tem conhecimento da, uh, da força executória da decisão. Obrigada. Alors, merci beaucoup pour cette uh, question. Est-ce que vous pourriez la traduire rapidement en français Parce que je n'ai pas de, de traduction et mon brésilien n'est pas très développé, malheureusement, mon portugais. Désolé. Je suis vraiment désolée, je pensais qu'il y avait de la traduction pour vous. Non. Euh, je voulais euh, juste savoir des choses. La première, si la décision, elle prévoit juste une obligation euh, de... Euh, S'il y a des obligations spécifiques, c'est juste une obligation générique, la décision du Conseil d'État. Et la deuxième question, c'est sur euh, comment on va exécuter cette décision une fois que le gouvernement... Euh, il ne fait pas son devoir. Comment le Conseil d'État va forcer le gouvernement à... à, 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 à enfin, le caractère de la décision qui m'inquiète un peu. D'accord. Alors, un, oui, il y a... Alors, il y a, sur le caractère, premièrement, spécifique des obligations. Là, le Conseil d'État laisse au gouvernement une marge d'appréciation. Il lui dit « Globalement, les mesures que vous prenez ne sont pas suffisantes, mais il ne lui dit pas quelles mesures le gouvernement doit adopter. » C'est au gouvernement de choisir les mesures et de revenir devant le Conseil d'État plus tard 
en lui disant « Voilà les mesures que j'ai adoptées dans neuf mois ». Il lui donne rendez-vous avec une clause de rendez-vous au 31 mars 2022. La décision a été prise en juillet 2021. On donne neuf mois au gouvernement pour présenter de nouvelles mesures. Donc, premièrement, pas de mesures spécifiques, c'est le gouvernement qui doit euh, les présenter. Deuxièmement, sur le caractère obligatoire, sur les moyens pour le juge euh, d'obliger l'État à agir. Ça, c'est une question universelle. Je crois que tous les juges du monde savent qu'il est difficile de contraindre un État à agir. Et pour avoir été effectivement membre du Conseil d'État il y a quelques années, je le sais bien aussi. Mais le Conseil d'État a développé une jurisprudence euh, dans laquelle il se donne des moyens pour obliger l'État, et en particulier des moyens euh, avec des sanctions financières, que nous appelons en français des astreintes, je ne sais pas s'il y a une traduction du mot, c'est pour ça que je parle de sanctions financières. Euh, dans neuf mois, le Conseil d'État va procéder à l'évaluation de ces mesures, euh, et si les mesures ne sont pas suffisantes, alors le Conseil d'État prononce des sanctions financières, et des sanctions financières extrêmement importantes. Pour vous donner un exemple, dans une autre affaire qui concerne euh, un problème d'environnement, le Conseil d'État a condamné l'État à 10 millions d'euros, 10 millions d'euros, par tous les six mois de retard, par semestre de retard. Donc ce sont des, des sanctions financières importantes et euh, aux sanctions financières s'ajoute une deuxième catégorie de sanctions, c'est le « name and shame », c'est la sanction de réputation, parce que il ne vous a pas échappé que euh, la clause de rendez-vous, c'est mars 2022, et qu'en France, en avril 2022, nous avons une élection présidentielle. Et donc… La, la, la pression sur le, le gouvernement français est importante à la veille des élections présidentielles d'avoir euh, vraiment euh, mis en œuvre les, la décision du, du Conseil d'État. Parfait, merci. Would it be possible for me to just add a few comments in addition to what Yann has responded? Because I think this is this question of uh, enforcement of court judgments is a very critical question. And I think there's two things which are worth saying. One is that in countries like Germany and the Netherlands, where the rule of, where the rule of law is strong, this is not really a question. There's an assumption that when a court issues a decision, a government will comply with that decision. And so we've seen in the context of climate change, the famous Urgenda decision of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands in 2019, which ordered the government to take uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions more quickly. The government of the Netherlands responded, as it should have, by taking action, by uh, closing down a coal-fired power plant early, by investing billions of euros in additional renewable energy. That is what we should expect from a government in a country where the rule of law is strong to respond to a court decision. Similarly, the decision earlier this year of the Constitutional Court of Germany in a climate case brought by young people. The Constitutional Court determined that the German government's climate actions and climate legislation was not consistent with its human rights obligations. And the government of Germany responded very quickly and very appropriately by amending its climate legislation and strengthening its climate change targets. So that's the first, that's the first key point. Where the rule of law is strong, we expect governments to follow court decisions. It can be more problematic in countries where the rule of law is weak. And let me provide you with an example. Uh, also in 2019, there was a group of 25 children and youth who went to the Supreme Court of Colombia and won a case. They, they won a decision in which the Supreme Court of Colombia found that the government's failure to prevent deforestation in the Colombian portion of the Amazon River watershed was a violation of the constitutional right to a healthy environment of these, of these children and youths. Unfortunately, in the ensuing two years, there has been very little progress on the ground in terms of reducing deforestation because the government of Colombia 
lacks the uh, lacks the resources, lacks the ability to take action to comply with that Supreme Court decision. So I think there's in those types of cases, we need to actually take a step back and recognize we need to take steps to strengthen the rule of law in order that courts can make uh, effective decisions. And I would also just my final note on this question is that a number of courts around the world in common law jurisdictions employ the remedy of continuing mandamus, which gives courts the authority after they've made their initial decision to continue to requ- continue to supervise the enforcement of that decision. And that has been effective in cases. I've seen that be effective in a decision from the Supreme Court of the Philippines, a decision from the Supreme Court of Argentina, uh, in both of those cases involving very detailed court orders to take specific actions to remedy uh, very grave situations of pollution. So that's quite a different approach from the uh, from the other approach, which is to give governments a margin to just tell them you need to achieve this objective, but how you achieve it is up to you. There are definitely court systems around the world where it's uh, considered appropriate for courts to provide much more specific guidance to governments in their in their decisions. Thank you. Muchas gracias por la ampliación. Realmente tenemos experiencias también en el caso de Costa Rica, donde la Sala Constitucional ha ordenado al Congreso la emisión de leyes ambientales en determinado sentido y en plazos específicos, con advertencias de desobediencia a la autoridad y órdenes al Ejecutivo de no importación de plaguicidas. Y realmente se han materializado estas advertencias que son bajo eh, iniciar procesos penales y se han ejecutado esos procesos penales realmente. Y está implícita esa sanción de reputación, sobre todo en estados ambientales tan fuertes como el nuestro. Eh, continuamos con Denise. Um, thank you very much for uh, the, to the panelists. Um, and and hello to all of them they're they're amazing people along with the co-chairs this has been a terrific panel my question has been touched upon a bit but i want to rephrase it um actually justice noer uh raised it in commenting on on david boyd's comments and she noticed how david pivoted in a very eloquent way from being somewhat critical of the soft law process but then pointing out some wonderful examples how soft law had turned into hard law So my question for all three panelists is, given the urgency that you all spoke to, either human rights, biodiversity crisis, or the climate crisis, what are the key accelerators of legal change for soft law to become hard law? What are the key accelerators that you have seen work, be it street power or judicial decisions or political change. So you all have so much experience in the soft law process and the hard law process. Give us some hopeful indicators and levers that you've seen work that accelerate it so we can catch up with the crises, have law catch up with these crises that we're facing. Thank you. I'm happy to jump in. My my colleagues are being very polite, but I think from my perspective, you know, these interlocking ecological crises that we face remind me of previous social crises that humanity has faced, where human rights have played a role as not a magic wand that solves the problems, but as a catalyst for changes that bring about solutions. And so we can go back to the abolition of slavery, when the law played a critical role and human rights played a critical role in the abolition of slavery. We can look at the the, the movement for women's rights dating back over 100 years, where women's assertion of their right to equality has caused great societal changes. And I think we're in a similar position now with the global environmental crisis, where we need to recognize that if we take this right to a healthy environment and we embed it in legal systems, then we can actually accelerate the pace of change. Um, My friend, the justice from Costa Rica, Costa Rica is a terrific example of this. The inclusion of the right to a healthy and ecologically balanced environment in Article 50 of the Costa Rican Constitution in 1993 was really a catalyst for Costa Rica to become a global leader in environmental protection. And we can look back at the the past 30 years of experience. Costa Rica has reversed the process of deforestation. You know, when the Constitution was amended to recognize the right to a healthy environment, only 25% of Costa, Costa Rica remained under forest cover. That's now over 50%. 
Costa Rica now generates over 99% of its electricity from renewable energy sources. Costa Rica is currently considering a law that will permanently prohibit oil and gas development in that small nation. So that's just one example of how the right to a healthy environment can be exactly as you suggested, an accelerator for positive changes. We're seeing that in France as well. And Yann could probably speak more uh, in, in greater detail to this, but since the uh, Charter for the Environment was added to the French Constitution in 2004. France has passed a number of globally pioneering laws related to fracking, pesticides, and, and others, due diligence for corporations, etc. So I think that that's my plea, is for countries to take this recognition of the right to a healthy environment seriously, put it in their constitutions, and then strengthen the rule of law so that those words have meaning. Thank you. Peut-être juste un mot pour, pour compléter, pour dire que je suis 100% d'accord avec David euh, sur le, le fait que le levier d'action, l'accélérateur, euh, le game changer, euh, je crois que c'est le juge et le citoyen. Je vois une sorte de binôme entre le citoyen et le juge. Le citoyen qui saisit le juge et le juge qui impose des changements sur la base euh, des droits environnementaux, avec une, euh, une approche de droits humains. Euh, ça prend du temps, ça n'est pas du jour au lendemain, mais les exemples donnés par euh, David sont, sont excellents sur l'égalité entre les hommes et les femmes, euh, sur euh, la, la lutte contre toutes les discriminations. C'est ce type euh, de binôme, juge et citoyen, qui font avancer les, les, les grandes causes, et euh, je crois de ce point de vue que la difficulté des hommes politiques, de l'action politique, c'est que les hommes politiques ont une contrainte, c'est l'élection. Il y a une contrainte de court terme. Ils ont devant eux la contrainte électorale. Euh, les décideurs économiques, pour leur part, les entreprises, ont une autre contrainte, c'est les marchés financiers, les actions des entreprises, euh, les actionnaires, euh, des, des, des entreprises. Donc, ces deux types de décideurs politiques et économiques sont enfermés dans euh, des difficultés de court terme. Alors que le juge, lui, le juge, il a le long terme devant lui. Il défend l'intérêt général. Et lorsqu'il est saisi par les citoyens, les deux ensemble, le juge et les citoyens, deviennent les gardiens des promesses. Les gardiens des promesses. Parce que les États font des promesses et donc, les juges veillent à ce que les États respectent ces, ces promesses. C'est pour ça que je crois qu'un des leviers d'action, c'est le juge et le citoyen. Et je finis par un mot un peu plus pessimiste, pardon. Mais malheureusement, euh, l'histoire nous montre que les hommes, les sociétés humaines ne changent vraiment que le jour des catastrophes. Il a fallu euh, des grandes révolutions pour adopter en France la Déclaration des droits de l'homme de 1789. Il a fallu la Seconde Guerre mondiale pour qu'on adopte euh, la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme. Je me demande, je ne veux pas être trop pessimiste, mais je me demande combien va-t-il falloir de catastrophes climatiques, combien va-t-il falloir euh, de villes rayé de la carte par la montée des eaux euh, Combien va-t-il falloir d'incendies de forêts au Canada, en Australie ou en Amazonie pour que enfin on se décide à agir Et j'ai peur, j'ai peur que, pour répondre à votre question, euh, ce soit les catastrophes qui soient malheureusement le seul véritable levier d'action qui oblige les hommes à agir. Si nous étions intelligents, nous agirions avant avant, mais tous les scientifiques nous le disent, la catastrophe, elle est devant nous et nous ne faisons rien. C'est ça mon inquiétude. Muchas gracias por sus palabras. Realmente el perfil del juez ambiental es totalmente diferente, es innovador, el perfil de la persona juzgadora que atiende asuntos ambientales. Nos queda solamente un minuto, vamos a atender la pregunta que nos plantea el doctor Wilson. Can I, could I just come in before that? I'm sorry, um, Robert Kahn with... Uh, as a judge, <laughs> I, I, I do want to emphasize that the job of a judge is to decide case in accordance with the law. Um, I mean, I'm 
nervous about this distinction between soft, what's called soft law. I don't know quite what it is. I mean, policies are may be relevant, but at the end of the day, one's concerned with the law. That's why it's so important that some most countries have a constitutional guarantee of the environment in their constitution. That is a law, and the courts have to give effect to it. Unfortunately, in my country, in America, they don't. Um, and uh, the European Court Convention of Human Rights didn't, because in 1948, when that was being drafted, people weren't thinking in those terms. But that doesn't mean that the judges can invent it. One has to work within the framework of the law one has. And I think it's terrible. I mean, and in a way, this was the, the why I was so keen that we could have uh, included in the COP26 debate some you know, genuine discussion of the function of law and how it operates in different systems. Because I don't think one can assume that what's right for one system will work for another. Like, you know, the Juliana case is a very good example of how the initial judges' attempts to try and sort of produce out of uh, the American Constitution a sort of environmental right which wasn't expressed ran into the sand in the later courts. So I think we've got to be very careful about thinking that judges can simply invent uh, laws that aren't there. But having said that, I couldn't agree more with the Anne that it is up to we really the countries and different jurisdictions must make sure that they put their commitments into legal form so they can be enforced. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Lord Robert. Escuchamos la pregunta del Dr. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much to the panelists for the deep insights into uh, the COP process. I wanted to follow up a bit on what Professor Antolini had brought up about uh, how to proceed now that we've got the action that was taken at the COP. And I guess that requires a characterization of that action somewhat similar to what the great speakers have said today. So from the point of view of what would take place in the future moving forward, um, Jan, I mean, you've worked so hard on the Global Pact and have been so rivetingly focused over the years on what's happening globally with the environment. And uh, maybe I could, um, with reference to your work, speak about the result from the point of view of our chief climate scientist who wrote an article in Hawaii when he returned. And that was that the COP was essentially a cop out and it was a message to future generations that the COP process just doesn't work. You're not going to be able to have the countries of the world come together with the special interests that are there and act with the kind of enthusiasm. And here's a word that was used many times, transformational change. The combination of authorities there, mm -hmm. the governments as well as the, the special interests that are there aren't going to be able to protect future generations. And that was consistent with the speech of Barack Obama. You'll recall he said that the COP process really, the reality is in the amount of time that we have the next nine or 10 years for transformational change, doesn't look like um, we're gonna be able to make it with the present kind of leadership formula and mix. So he said, the number one path to transformational change is for young people to vote and to vote like their life depends upon it. With that said, Jan or, or David, and, and I know I've always admired, Robert, your commitment to the rule of law and not getting carried away as a judge, but are we at the point now where when judges tell the truth in terms of the nature of the emergency, maybe the way they characterize it in the United States and the federal courts will be characterized a bit differently if what Barack Obama says or our chief climate scientist says is the truth, that now there's a strong message that future generations aren't being served by the process, the, a process that can be uh, uh, can, can a process essentially in which the future generations are not able to have at this time a successful um, 
shall we say, um, uh, recognition of their right to life. Things have gotten more serious, and now the right to life is really at stake. And therefore, from the point of view of judges, it's uh, even more necessary to be able to act with that factual context when it comes to hard law situations such as uh, climate litigation. So uh, thank you. How, how do we proceed from here if it's true that the COP process isn't really gonna lead us to the transformational change that's needed in the next uh, eight or nine years? Thank you, Madam Chair. Gracias usted por la pregunta. No sé si alguno de los oradores desea referirse. Well, I think Justice Wilson has really put his his finger on the on the critical question, which is, you know, the intergovernmental panel mm -hmm. on on climate change has said very clearly that we need rapid, systemic, and transformative change, and that 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 is the challenge before us. Um, and so, I think. In the face of that scientific evidence, you know what the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called "code red for humanity." It, there comes a point in time, I think, where we have to actually challenge some of the existing legal wisdom, legal conventions that are that are holding us back. I'll give you one example. One example is standing. So we still have courts in this day and age that are denying standing to citizens to bring cases to court asserting that their human rights are being violated on the basis that they're not directly affected, that they can't establish a, a, personal, a personal interest, whether economic or physical. I think that's a, that's a legal doctrine that's not fit for purpose in the 21st century, given the environmental challenges we face. I think that um, Justice Wilson mentioned the right to life. And the reality is that Given what we know scientifically, whether it's about air pollution or the climate crisis, the right to life is undoubtedly jeopardized by these environmental threats. And so, you know, that's not the right to life is not soft law. The right to life is found in every constitution in this in this world. So uh, I think that this this is a point where there needs to just be judicial appreciation of the gravity of these threats and With, without that kind of recognition of the gravity of the threats, then courts are not going to be able to play an effective role in, in defending human rights. And that I think we have a lot of debates about whether it's legitimate for courts to uh, intervene in these types of environment and climate cases. From my perspective, there's absolutely no question that courts are not only have a legitimate role to play, but have an essential role to play because human rights are being violated every day. I mean, the countries I visit, Fiji, Kenya, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, people's lives are being adversely impacted every single day by the climate crisis. And so that that begs the question of, you know, are, are we powerless to protect the rights of these people? Which raises interesting questions about extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, and I think we could probably have an entirely separate conversation about extraterritoriality and the, the, the need to articulate obligations that are commensurate with the magnitude of the problem in the 21st century. Thank you. Can I just say, I, 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 I assume that was Michael Wilson. I didn't really hear the question, but there was, he was saying that we must assume that COP26, the COP process is not working. If he's saying that, I don't agree. I think it's the best show in town and we've got to make it work. Obviously, if young people can change things by voting, that's excellent and I hope they'll do that, and take a real interest. But I still don't think the courts can invent the law. The courts have to give effect to the laws there are. I mean, in, in my country, we've long since abandoned restrictive notions of standing. We, we regard the environment as a matter of legitimate interest to everyone but we still think we have to work within the laws we have. And I'm afraid, uh, I mean, I, I'm now past six, I'm retired. Younger judges may take a different view, but I'm afraid that is where I was, my view. And the law, we can't move away from the concept of the rule of law is that we apply the rules of law that we have. All right, thank you. Could I just uh, jump in? For a short comment from Norway, and maybe it's not so much about law that about 
the th fact that both politicians and courts, they are not working in isolation. They are dependent on the uh, uh, assumptions in society and the feelings in society. And I hope that we can get some good communicators uh, who can tell us in tell people in ordinary words how uh, big the crisis is and how much uh, it, one needs to act here and now. And in Norway, we have had, as you all have had the COVID crisis, but we have had some very good communicators. And it's quite interesting to see how much people kind of are willing to change, to do things when those who uh, develop the message do it in a way which is trustworthy and in clear and simple language. So I think too much of that communication skills now is among people who deny climate change, who are against the policies. And that, as I said, this is not very much law, but I hope for good communicators who can uh, communicate to the world that we need to do some changes, which also will affect us negatively. Muchas gracias a los extraordinarios panelistas y a los desafiantes preguntas formuladas que nos dejan mucho que pensar sobre lo que debemos hacer los jueces y las juezas en esta década crítica. Muchas gracias por todo. Vamos por concluir este panel.